Hello lovelies, today we embark on a literary journey that goes beyond the covers and delves into the profound influence that books have on some of my favourite people. I'm your host, Venice, and in each episode we'll be sitting down with remarkable people to explore the pages that shape their creative landscape. Join us as we uncover the stories that ignited their passion and the narratives that left an incredible mark. So grab your favorite reading nook, settle in, and let's explore Between the Pages, books for ultimate inspiration. Today I have with me Thomas Joseph Brown, one of the smartest cookies I know, who's about to share all of his smartness in a workshop this week called Awakening Archetypal Vision. Thomas is a natural philosopher exploring what he terms the cognitive sciences and pragmatic metaphysics. He was an editor of the Journal of Borderland Research, and his goal is to expand consciousness beyond the accepted paradigms of the modern world. So, hello, Thomas. Good morning, Venice. Thank you for and what's going to be, I think, another very fun conversation. Well, look, as as you know, I call you one of my smartest friends ever. So I literally cannot wait to see the books that have made you such a smart cookie. Oh, great. I know somebody introduced me once and said, arguably the smartest man on earth. And I said, well, I'm the first one to argue <laughs> with that. Because so, <laughs> I know a lot of very intelligent people and um, I'm honored to hang out with them that they some of it rubs off and I'm happy to share. Well, that's why I'm here. You've rubbed off on me, definitely, darling. So many of like the really fantastic yeah. ideas that I like to play with have come from you. And so this is two reasons why I wanted to interview you. I wanted to find out about your books that truly have inspired you. And I also wanted to kind of get a better handle on this course that you're, you're doing very soon. Um, because again, it's kind mm -hmm. of a big brain idea and I know I want it, but I don't know why I want it. So let me ask you, do any of the books that you talk about today speak to this course that's coming up? Yes, they all do. So we'll go through a few of those that are influencing directly the subjects that we're going to talk here. You know, people ask me, you know, what are your favorite, list 10 favorite books? And I'm like, well, which, which subject? Um, because I've got a lot of favorite books and which ones can influence. But there's one that is overall influence on all my work, and it's a book called Man or Matter by Ernst Lairs. And the subtitle is Introduction to a Spiritual Understanding of Nature on the Basis of Goethe's Method of Training, Observation, and Thought. And that's fundamentally what this workshop is going to be about, is how do you train your mind for higher ideas. And now I was first turned onto this book in 1986 by Trevor Constable, 85, 86, in his book, The Cosmic Pulse of Life, which came out 1976, The Revolutionary Biological Power Behind UFOs. And um, I ended up editing the second edition, which we put out in 1990 through Borderland Sciences. And basically, he goes through kind of the history of Borderland and, you know, just different ideas. He gets into Rudolf Steiner, Wilhelm Reich, and Ruth Drown with her radionics work. And really what we're going to look at in this workshop is not so much Steiner, but what I see is the outgrowth of Steiner. And, of course, Manor Matter, Ernst Layers, he was the first science teacher of the Waldorf school system. And what this book does is it really teaches you what an idea is and how to conceive an idea and how ideas metamorphosed through time as humanity sort of developed technology and moved out of the Renaissance era because consciousness changes as we move. So the importance of this book, he gets into two main streams. First, you know, I was talking to a young friend of mine the other day, he goes, man, that's a hard read. I said, yeah, it's like climbing a mountain. But when you get there, the view is absolutely incredible. And it is a hard read because you have to basically uh, understand concepts of philosophy, which did take me a long time to get because I didn't really understand where they were going or what the import was. Although I got it in general, I didn't, you know, I wasn't missing it, but I wasn't getting the larger picture. So he gets into that, the basis of 
our functional system, our nervous system, our metabolic system, and how we have this rhythmic system balancing it, just so we understand how the system works. And then he gets into the first thing is the metamorphoses of plants, Goethe's work on that, and basically how this philosophy as it developed in the Western world, kind of the king of the philosophers, Immanuel Kant, which basically I see as the man who limited the ability of consciousness to move forward. It was strictly the discursive. And, you know, he, he believed there was a super sensible realm, but we can't ever attain it. You know, that it's for, forever beyond us. So he basically said that, you know, there's a moral order behind it. You know, so basically it was sort of religious. So he basically, he was the man who sort of firmly divided sort of science and spirituality, which science took all of his science side and threw the spirituality out eventually as things move forward. And Goethe said in his essay, Intuitive Judgment, which is discussed in Lehrer's book, is he shows that he's a living example that Immanuel Kant was wrong. And not only can we see the super sensible, but it's our birthright. And in order to do that, we need to grasp these higher ideas and the metamorphoses of plants, seeing the whole of a plant from you know, seed, shoot, the leaves, up to the flowering stage. This is basically the whole of the plant. We can hold it in our mind. so. We can look at a plant in this state of consciousness we're discussing right now, and you can only see the plant at one particular stage, but in your consciousness, you can develop the entire plant. And it, that takes you out of this temporal realm. You can still be in the now, but you can see it going both directions. And this creates a higher order. As he said, Goethe said, every process of nature properly comprehended, opens up a new organ of cognition and consciousness. And Rudolf Steiner developed this further, that these are actually tools of the imagination. You know, the imagination is something, well, I got, you have a crazy imagination. You know, the imagination is actually the way to actually perceive these higher order functions. So anyway, this is, the book gets into that, and then it gets a little bit further. It goes deep into a number of subjects like substances as letters of nature's script. And we don't get into this in this particular workshop, but he talks about like water, water being hydrogen and oxygen. And of course, this is all about gravity and levity. So oxygen is like gravity bound, right? Oxidizes things, pulls them down to earth. Whereas hydrogen that like pulls us, that's levity, right? It's hot as burning, it rises up. And in fact, in the book, The Nature of Substance, which is another book we'll cover shortly here, um, Rudolf Hauschka says hydrogen was improperly named. It should be called pyrogen because it's the hottest thing. He said, if you, if you look at the oceans and the lakes and you see this bluish sort of color, that's the oxygen, not the hydrogen. So, the, so when the two of them come together, they create a special substance. It's not just H2O, but you're dealing with a combination of hydrogen, uh, of levity and gravity that create this magical substance with all these anomalous properties. So it's a, it's a new way of looking at um, matter, like I say, as, as letters of nature's alphabet. And from there, he, he gets into um, Goethe's theory of color, the non-Newtonian color. And this is something, and I would recommend people, you know, doing the workshop that, get yourself a prism and you know, we have these basic little cards that you can look at and you look at it through a prism and you don't see white, you know, let's say, okay, let's, let me get this one card here. So if you look at this, according to Goethe's theory, when you look at this, you just should just see a spectrum of seven colors, but you don't, you'll see like a red yellow here and a blue violet here and it's reversed down here. Um, so you work yourself through these cards and you start realizing there is no color in light. The color only appears where light and dark come together. Now, the modern theory is, is they've done mathematical analysis of this. And I've got all the slides. We go through this in the workshop. It's, the workshop is going to be about four hours long. It's intensive. And we go through basically sort of three levels of ideas in order to get the greater idea. So it's sort of an intensive 
workshop. And this is kind of what I got out of Lair's book. I don't think I even got it the first time. It was probably the second time I read it that I really understand that he was helping us create these ideas in our mind and that the ideation is the organ of consciousness. So we think of people today, right? Consensus reality, that's an organ of consciousness. And as we know, because we've discussed this um, with Michael Nell's book, right? The Indoctrinated Brain. Everybody's indoctrinated into consensus reality. And, and especially like skeptics, people have studied like sciences or a lot of them that didn't study it that deeply, but accepted everything. Or doctors. The so-called... Doctors might be yeah, indoctrinated. The so-called skeptics, which I call the pseudo-skeptics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the modern pseudo-skeptics that consider themselves skeptics, but they're really naysayers of anything that doesn't fit the materialistic paradigm. Um, so that becomes their organ of consciousness, and they can't break out of it. So these are ways of training to basically come out. And as I, as I say, and I point this out at the beginning of my workshops, you know, I can't, I can't teach you anything. I can only make you think. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just really good at arguing my perspective and sharing it and hoping that people can, you know, gain from that. You know, it's, it's an intellectual discourse. Well, look, I just did a whole podcast on the materialist paradigm right now. Like I just finished it. And mm. I guess the point for me is that it's a half truth at the very best and at worst, it's a big lie, mm -hmm. right? And so these kinds of books, I think, are really instructive in the way that they can open your mind. And what's really important and something that you said is that there's kind of fundamental levels of information that you have to grok before you can even get some of these bigger ideas. And that's probably why the workshop takes so long. But that's why, you know, there's you, you, there's um, fundamental knowledge that has to kind of get stuck in there before you can really perceive the greater truth. And I was saying, you know, because I've read so much Schwala and he has this idea of the pharaonic consciousness, and that's something that I've tried to mm -hmm. play with. And like you said, use my imagination. And somewhat it has opened the doors and has opened the veils to this non-material realm. And so I think that I'm going to agree with your friend because I did get that book. And it is a hard read. <laughs> but it sounds like it's well worth it, darling. So I'm going to get into it. So what's the next one you have there? Okay. Well, I just wanted to finish oh, sure. just to say that. This, this workshop is basically structured in three ideas. The first one, sort of philosophical, you know, how the modern materialistic paradigm eventuated and what the ways around it are, uh, introducing Goethe's concepts. Then the second part actually is the metamorphoses of plants and how we can develop that, but how that when we get to the deeper levels of that, that actually brings us up to what we call cosmological botany, that the, the formative processes of the plants actually come from the cosmos, but not just some vague sort of energies coming in. This is like definitive representation on the earth plane of cosmic motions as they appear from earth, like Mercury, Sun, um, Synodic period in the uh, monocotyledons, and the Venus Sun synodic period and the dicotyledons, you can see the signature. There's a lot more to it than that. And we, we don't get too deeply because people have to study this, but I'm trying to show the general ideas to open up consciousness to how these ideas flow because the gateway to the higher worlds. What's that? Sorry, darling. I was just going to say, is this where you got oh, Lily's Kalisco work from? That ties in, and we don't really cover that in this workshop because there's so much of this material. Um, but just so for that, people that don't that don't know what I'm talking about, Thomas was the one who told me about a woman that did science, actual scientific experiments that showed the effects of the planets on chemical reactions. And so, again, it's exactly this idea that the cosmos does, in fact, impact us on a very, very material level even though the immaterial explanation of why is lost to us exactly well in brief what lily was showing was is it metal crystallization right she set out to see if there was actually any 
truth to the ancient uh, alchemical concepts of thought, like gold in the sun, silver in the moon. So she did all these experiments. And the simple one to explain to people, because there's a lot of complex experiments, is, is that during a solar eclipse, when the moon is in front of the sun, the gold won't crystallize properly, right? The patterns are distorted. And um, yeah, that, that's a whole other workshop, um, which we will do in the future. Um, basically, I worked this whole thing out into like six modules, which and there was still a couple to go. And this workshop is three of the modules sort of combined to give this greater ideation of what archetypal thought actually is. So, yeah, so it all ties in the cosmological botany and Lily Kalisco's work there. They all show the same thing is the same underlying natural scientific qualitative process. Um, and in this, and this is another thing we won't discuss in this workshop, but in others, um, four worlds, right? People think of the different, I was at heliocentric, geocentric, flat, whatever, you know, everybody's got their ideas. So I spent literally a couple decades kind of going through all these different worldviews and concepts. There's the heliocentric, that's like the computer system, that's like the computer. Then there's the geocentric, or more properly anthropocentric where the energies of the universe are all flowing in and modulated by the planets. And that's what I'm saying. So we have scientific experiments that show the effects of the heliocentric and the geocentric. And what we find in the plant morphology is both of them are intertwined, but the geocentric is dominant, which means that you can't like take a plant and um, take it over to Mars and expect it to grow the same. So I've looked at like plants, growing in space and things is some preliminary experimentation in that way. And it's interesting to see, you know, they do it in microgravity. The Chinese did some on the moon, but they just sprouted it and killed it. And I don't know. Um, anyway, but this is, these are things to look at in it. Um, but anyway, some of the other books, well, one of the other books then is, well, I mentioned Cosmic Pulse of Life by Trevor Constable, which I edited the second edition of that. And that's, a really good one because that gets into the four ethers and Rudolf Steiner's work and ties it in with uh, Wilhelm Reich's work, the orgone research, which is again, there's so many little things. I mean, this you know, workshop could go on for 10 hours, but I'm trying to stay focused on the concept of archetypal vision. So one of the other ones, um, the planetary influences upon plants, cosmological botany by um, Ernst Michael Kranich. And that's the one where he actually gets into the scientific and mathematical aspects of how these planetary influences come in and form the morphology. So fa fascinating work. I tell people that's actually the greatest spiritual book I ever read because it was actually after reading that and again, I had to read a couple of times. You kind of have to study these things. And I was out meditating in my garden one day and looking at flowers and thinking about how the plants move around and I just felt this like whole higher connection. Like I was connected to this whole, cause I mean, I'm always tracking. I know where the planets are around me and center of the galaxy and everything. You know, just, you know, spatial awareness of everything all the time, but it really put me in that higher state of consciousness. And that's what this is about. It's about existing in the anthropocentric world, right? Escaping the third rock from the sun. Most people don't think about it, but if they do, they think that they're, on that, unless they've broken out and believe in some like flat earth, which is sort of a psyop that wakes people up. It, it's kind of a trap because there are real aspects of it, um, the planar world. Um, but the plane happens to be wrapped around a globe uh, <laughs> because we can measure it and determine it. And um, anyway, but that's a whole other subject. Maybe we'll do a workshop on that. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting one. because there's so many levels of things too that are metaphorical as well, right? They're not, um, they're absolutely 100% useful as a metaphor, but they might not actually apply in terms of material science, for example, right? And so metaphorically, yeah. there's aspects of the, flat earth that really are helpful. Right. Well, what they get this this form of liberation, because this friend of mine um, who I worked with on a legal project, brilliant woman, and she's she going, oh, man, this flat earth, have you checked? I go, yeah, I've been looking at that stuff for about four decades now, you know, she's she's going, no, man, I'm, I'm convinced now. I said, how long did it take to convince you? Like a day? And she goes, yeah. 
So I actually ran her through a few things and talked to her for a while. And she goes, no, she goes, I get you. She goes, you know, but what was weird? She said, it's like the most amazing feeling of liberation came over me. I said, that's a trick. That's how they trick people. I said, it's, he's like a, 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 a kooky occult psychologists at the alphabet agencies are cranking this stuff out. They know this four world stuff. Yeah. You know, they, they can play these trips and part of it. So one of the other books influencing and we'll have images and stuff out of here is called the plant between sun and earth by George Adams and Olive Witcher subtitled the science of physical and ethereal spaces. Wow. That sounds amazing. These are, I was reading these things. Yeah. Back in the eighties, I got all turned on to this. I just totally dug in. I, I couldn't get enough of it at the time. And that's what we understand. So there's space and counter space. And we'll touch on that a little bit and try to get some conceptual concepts. So space, right? You have a point. And the point, the point's a center, right? A consciousness is the center. And that's where everybody thinks. And it's interesting because, you know, everybody thinks 3D reality. So now the point's outside. And Steiner said that that, that was one of the uh, great, gravest errors of Humanity's descent beneath matter was the removal of this proprioceptive inner threefold nature externally as the Cartesian coordinate system. Wow. Right? So everybody thinks space is 3D, but where is there three dimensions of space? Wave your arm. Show me three dimensions out here. And they go, well, you know, you look at this table, right? It's high, it's wide. I go, that's your determination, your interpretation because of your threefold nature. But where does that exist in space itself? It doesn't anywhere. Look, I heard this kid say the other day there was no, like the universe doesn't have dimensions because it's ultimate width, ultimate height, ultimate everything. And so there are no dimensions in reality. Is that kind of the same idea that you're talking about? To to what, an inconceivable infinity? Where does that one end? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, this is it. Like, this is it, my it, question. It, when I heard it, it was a radical idea because I've got that threefold perception of, you know, of, and four, yeah, I had time we're, to we're it. Trained with it. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, I mean, would you, yeah. would like reality, does reality actually have dimensions or the universe? I, I don't two. know. It's got two. Well, as far as our local sort of plane of, existence which sustains our biological units and our consciousness rides in there's two space and time right space can't be three dimensions that's why i call it space because you got you have space right <laughs> it, it is space and um that's what um that the tesla genius eric dollar taught me long ago when we were experimenting he said you know that, that's it you know you, to understand tesla physics you know the real tesla physics where you making the faster and light you know, non-electromagnetic waves, you know, you, you only use space and time. Those are the only two dimensions you need. And those are the only two dimensions that you need in plant morphology uh, because it's all point and plane. So you have the point in projective geometry and you can expand the point like a balloon that you can keep blowing up to infinity, but it doesn't have to get that big before you can like cut a flat tabletop out of it, right? Doesn't have you don't even have to go to infinity. Um, so basically, the infinite plane is the other side. So conceptually, it takes a while to conceive this, but those are the two sides of the universe, right? The the point and plane, and all biological life operates on these. Sometimes they intertwine, and they're mediated, right? This is a whole other big subject, and um, I've got people that can get on and explain it far better than I can. I understand it in a basic conceptual thing. So if we look at like homeopathy, you know, there's all these different ways people think of different ways of how it might work, but in proper homeopathy, where you do the succussion, you know, let's say whether it's through the powder or the water. So you have a drop of something and you put it in, you know, so 10x, 100x, and you're succussing it. So what you're actually doing is you're basically moving towards the non-material aspects, the qualitative nature of what the original substance is. And 
and past the 23rd decimal potency, Avogadro's number, I mean, there's technically no substance left, whatever, but some of those are some of the most powerful homeopathic remedies. And they even do, in some of the remedies, you can do what they call potency curves. So at different potencies, certain ones will have like higher activity, you know, because of the nature of the thing as you're getting out towards the periphery and where the cosmic forces are worked into the substance. So there's this whole complex higher realm around us. And that's really what this workshop is. It starts introducing people to this, right? You can't teach this stuff in a day. I'm still trying to figure it out at my age, but I have a grounding in it. You know, I, you know, I understand the um, anthroposophic realm. You know, it's naturally where I live and conceive. I can conceive of all these different worlds. And it's, it's a meditation. It's like a walking, living meditation through your life and you relate it to. And it comes down to a theory of knowledge. What is a theory of knowledge? It's like, well, what you learned at school? Yeah, because you, you know, you're programmed in the consensus reality with it. But it, my theory of knowledge is a mandala based on the Vajrayana mandala. And I'll throw that in. That's one of the books that influences. We'll go through some other ones. Um, but one of them is, is the, um, the foundations of Tibetan mysticism by Lama Anagarika Govinda. And we'll get back into that in a bit, but I wanted to throw in some of the other books. The Rediscovery of Color by Heinrich Proskauer. And in that, that's actually what these cards I held up, right? Where you go through with the prism and progressively remove yourself. And what you see is, is there's actually two spectra that you can project by looking through a prism. You, know, you basically look through a prism like this, down at the card, you have to get to the right thing and go, okay. And you can basically start seeing, um, you know, exactly how the light and color works. Despite the mathematical analysis that they now have through Snell's law and, you know, the so-called three receptors of the eye, which actually operate differently. And we get into this. I have all, you know, we get quite detailed in this workshop on, because there's a beam coming out of the eye. Ernst Lairs talks about this, the eye beam. And so does Trevor Constable and uh, the Cosmic Pulse of Life. And, um, you know, when I first got into this, I started going out and practicing my eye beam, like going up on a hill in California and looking out to sea and scanning the horizon back and forth with my eyes relaxed. And after a while, you start like seeing ships like way, way out to sea. And, um, you know, and it would actually make me sneeze. Like, you know, I'd run my eye beam back and forth and it would like, when I'd come across a ship, I could feel it like up in my sinuses and stuff. And you, know, you start That's sneezing crazy. and you know, like clear your sinuses out and you can see better. It's all, it's all tied in. And um, I spent too much time in front of the computer lately. I don't exercise that stuff as much as I used to. I need to actually get out and do it more. Um, but that's, that really works. Um, and this is how vision works. Work. So you have like what we call complementary colors. You know, you, you stare at like a red dot, you know, for a minute or two, and then you look at a white sheet and you see the green dot. Well, according to the three receptor series, the only way that that works is because, well, the receptors get tired from staring. You know, vision doesn't really work that way. What you really realize is once you start going through these exercises and doing them, that that green you see is actually what comes out of your eye and meets the red out here. So what you start realizing this whole modern paradigm where the only, you know, things aren't really that color, right? You see a red ball. It's not really red. It's, it doesn't have any color at all. There's no real colors. It's just a vibration. It goes into your eye and then it turns into this electrochemical thing goes up and your brain interprets it. It's all secondary quality. And this is something we deal with all through here is the primary and secondary qualities is that the primary qualities, and this we get into in the first part, the philosophical, weight, mass, position, motion, that's it. Those are the primary qualities. And what are the secondary qualities? Sight, sound, touch, hearing. <laughs> so, um, so wouldn't like vibration be one that, though, darling? Like vibration or resonance or frequency or something of that matter? Wouldn't that be a primary characteristic? Yeah, that's motion. That's motion. Okay. Yeah, so the the vibrations are motion, right? Because that motion is one of the primary qualities. But 
the color is not there. It's only your interpretation of those vibrations that makes the color. Sure. That's so the primary and secondary qualities, secondary qualities is everything you sense. Yeah. Or perceive. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. 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 But according to science, those are all illusions. Right. So secondary qualities are illusions. But what we get into, and the reason we introduce cosmological botany and some of these higher concepts, is you start understanding that the secondary qualities are basically the spiritual hierarchies. What? And their languages is the color and expression through the biosphere. Like people say, oh, well, we live in a simulation. You know, they've, they've been staring at their computer too long and they got this computer god complex thing. Simulation of what? You know, oh, well. Um, Humans make up 0.01% of the biomass of the biosphere. You know, so all of this, this whole complex cosmic thing is happening, you know, for some computer game thing, right? It's like some funny thing. So um, anyway, so you start connecting with these higher spheres. And we don't get into it too deeply. We touch on it because people have to discover this for themselves. I'm just sharing what I've discovered along the way. And people may see it differently. In fact, a lot probably will. And I'm happy to argue in order to understand their perspective as well. And hopefully after, you know, since this thing's going to be a few hours in three sections, we'll probably take breaks at a couple points and take questions and have a bit of dialogue to, to carry forward before we go into the next section. Um, but, but then, yeah, once you understand that this reality is real out here and it's real in here, and I sort of, um, finish up this is why I get into the t oh, one of the things that another book I wanted to mention was the spectrochrometry encyclopedia by Din Shah Gadi Ali because in, in Goethe's theory of color right you have the revert the positive and negative spectrums we can call them you know the positive spectrum with green in the middle it's dominant which is why the materialistic consciousness was fooled by it and sure enough even though green doesn't come out of a prism it it always appears later on. They've got this whole mathematical analysis that explains it. And that's it, right? Because that's what they believe and they can engineer it and it works for optics. And it's what Ernst Lairs calls the one-eyed colorblind approach. He says, you don't have to see color to know optics. He, you know, and he said the same with acoustics. He said, basically, a deaf person can study acoustics on a graph, right? They don't even have to hear this stuff. You know, and, and a blind person can learn about color by by being told what's on the graphs. Right? It's like so we need this full sensory sort of connection to really understand. And well, what enriches our soul? Right. When we die and our life flashes before our eyes and we go on to the next realm, unless you don't believe on that because you're a materialist. What do you take with you? What you experienced or what some scientists told you? Yeah. Right. Well, I can tell you, you know, I do so many videos, right? I do editing, audio editing, and I, I can basically look at the wavelengths and tell you when there's a sneeze or a cough or an um or an ah uh, or a word that ends in a t, right? So I'm, I'm getting good at reading the wavelengths, but it's nowhere near the joy of experiencing the voice, right? So it's the same kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do that too. After I record audio for videos, I go through and I can see. I, I don't even have to listen to it. I can go pick out. There's an arm. There's an arm. There's you know, an arm. Little, um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I clean those all out. Um, so yeah, no, there. I'm not knocking science. There's a brilliant materialistic science that helps. It's the interpretation of it which holds back the further development. Yeah. Yeah. See, because like with te with Tesla's work. You know, with his um, non-electromagnetic, you know, longitudinal faster and light waves, you know, he was, he was, uh, people say, well, Tesla was foreseeing the cell phone, right? He was talking about it, right? But he was saying, we'd all have these things. We could talk to anybody anywhere in the world, but you never needed power. You didn't plug it in. It never needed power. Nothing needed power ever again, Right. He, he, and his system was going to be built to last at least a thousand years. And he was building a backup system in South Africa, right? In case they had to take it offline. So, you know, your vehicle, you could fly around in discs, you know, you power your house, everything. Of course, 
he was a bit mad. He wanted to light the atmosphere at night so you didn't need street lights and stuff. I'm going, well, yeah, I don't know about all his ideas, but <laughs> there's some, uh, but the concepts that were there, and if he had come out with his um, worldwide power system in 1912 when he was going to gift it to the world, um, you know, we technology would have developed completely different. So sure, we've got this, what we consider fantastic technology, but it's extremely detrimental to our health and to the biosphere. You know, we know this through books like, um, which I didn't put on here because it didn't directly influence this workshop, but it has influenced my line of thought, which is The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, where he shows that the whole development of modern diseases is uh, totally concomitant and in step with the development of electrical technology. Um, that's amazing. And, I know you've spoken to me about that before. And, and uh, in fact, Lily Kalisco work was impacted by that because this is when they started radar. And all of a sudden, it looked like the sun didn't work anymore because they were electrifying the atmosphere. So like, until you like some of these ideas are just so incredibly big and so hard to get your mind around. But the idea that something as simple as electricity could have such deleterious effects. And this also came up around the COVID time, we were talking about that, because also a lot of this, I mean, it goes on and on, right? The sunspots affect, you know, viruses and bacteria and all those kinds mm -hmm. of things and electricity does. And we, it's like, we don't even have any clue with the degree with which we're messing things because we've, we're dealing in half truths and it's just, it's, 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 it's amazing. We've lasted this long, darling, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, totally. Well, I wanted to say too, well, I mean, a lot of these actually ideas we covered it. And, you know, I gave the talk, the anthropocentric universe, you know, for the uh, last magical Egypt uh, summit. So, right. Yeah. We have gone through these ideas in the past. They're just not particularly on this one and they're continually refined and moving forward. So we'll do, more workshops on it in the future. But to get through all this and right then we get basically the six pointed star of color, right? We have red, yellow, green at the top, blue, violet, and then magenta at the bottom. So you basically have two sides. You've got like red, yellow, blue, violet. You bring them together in light in a slit. You get green in the middle. You pull them apart, no green, green, no green. But you bring them together or, you know, around an object rather than a slit and you get magenta in the middle. And that's what you see looking through the prism. You can see the two spectra, but they make this six pointed star. And basically then I get into Dinshaw's work, Dinshaw Gadiali, the um, Parsi Edison who developed the spectrochrome system, which basically the whole structure of the body is based on this. And he developed this whole therapeutic system that worked so well. He, they basically kept taking him through trial after trial, trying to knock the guy down back in the forties. And, he won every, he was winning and winning until this big trial in New York, big federal trial. And um, he was winning that just to, as arguments, right? Because he knew what he was talking about. And he was standing up, defending himself against all these color experts from General Electric and Kodak. And his lab got firebombed and to such a degree that basically all his equipment melted everything and totally devastated the guys. No evidence, sorry, you lose. Um, and then they you know, for, forbid him from using the word spectrochrome. But it's fantastic. And I show in here, people have done dark field uh, microscope work on biophotons that they've been able to isolate and do. And you actually see the six pointed star inside of the biophotons. So of evolving at different magnification. So we know that this is here. And then we start showing, start getting into the ethers. They introduced the e Steiner's concept of the ethers through books like, which, Basically, the cosmic pulse of life introduces the ethers, and so does man or matter. That's kind of like the final part of, of man or matter, and that's the final sort of part of this. We, the basic concept of the ethers, you know, warmth, light, tone, and life, and how they operate and function, and they actually have sort of color and shape characteristics, which tie into the whole spectral thing, and they tie in. So I'm kind of comparing things from Gunter Voxmas, these etheric formative forces in cosmos, earth, and man, and Dinshaw's work in the way he showed that these concepts work 
within the body. So we're kind of cross-referencing these different systems because we're dealing with primary archetypes not as symbols we're looking at, but as functional realities that we can create these ideas in our mind and experience around us and see in the sky, right? The, the sun, the yellow sun and the blue sky. That's all part of this whole archetypal structure. And ultimately then I sort of finished with some concepts from uh, Anagarika Govinda's book, The Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism. And I did, I mean, from when I was young, Probably when I was about 10, I think I've got, for my birthday, I've got, you know, the deluxe Dover edition of um, uh, Wallace Budge's Egyptian <laughs> Book of the Dead. When you were you know, 10. I, asked, I asked my parents for it. 10. I love this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and just, uh, I just wanted to know, right, because uh, the Book of the Dead, I, somewhere I heard about the concept, and I think I want I want to know the pathway. I want to go, you know, go through the the, the you know, pylons of Amenta. I want to know where the hell I'm going, right? Where's the map? Even at 10, kind of to have a 10-year-old child contemplating his mortality and the afterlife journey, it's pretty uh, advanced, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I always, I always kind of knew I was just passing through. Um, I'm amazed I made it this far, the wildlife I had when I was young. <laughs> anyway, I did. And, um, but then I got into Tibetan stuff, probably when I was about 12, I started reading, um, Lobsang Rampa, the third eye and cave of the ancients. And it was fascinating, but then I realized it was probably sort of fictional. Uh, and I'm, I was immediately on to probably by the time I was 13, 14, reading Evans Wentz, you know, translations, Tibetan book of the dead and, you know, Tibetan yoga and secret doctrines. And I was like mapping this stuff out. You know, I had notebooks where I basically mapped out the, you know, the bardo according to the way that um, Evans Wentz did it. We f found out later, you know, when editions came out like Chogyam Trungpa's sort of um, edition, which actually have here, let me grab it here. I've carried this little pocket edition for many years. Yeah, the Fremantle Trungpa version. And um, if you can see, I've actually got it color coded. Because <laughs> this You're is on to it. the map, <laughs> the map of the. Well, this is really ultimately it's all about that, right? You're passing through. You know, you do everything you can and have as good of a life you can and enjoy it because that's part of the experience of soul growth. But like I say, we're just passing through, and part of the passing through is to learn about all of this stuff. But I was studying, and I didn't really understand why I was reading all these, you know, jewel ornament of liberation, and it was like cool stuff. You know, I was reading the different sutras and Chan and Zen teachings, and same time I was reading, you know, Crowley and Dion Fortune and Kenneth Grant and all of that. You know, I was going through my later teens into my twenties. You know, this was totally absorbed. But once in I was probably early twenties, I came across Anagarika Govinda's, you know, Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism. And I read through that and all of a sudden it all made sense. And um, in the mandala and what it was, it, that we are the mandala, right? The skandhas is us. I, I suppose I was reading it from like, you know, the heart sutra and the, you know, the diamond, basically the diamond sutra, you know, the emptiness of, you know, the forms, the skandhas. But for some reason or another, when I read that book, it was like a schematic layout of everything in detail with the colors and the mandala and the aspects. And it's going, this is it. But realize Anagarika Govinda, he was German, right? Uh, I forget his birth name, but he was obviously very enlightened man. He went through, he went through like the Theravadan and Mahayana and then the Vajrayana. And this book is basically sort of the distillation of everything he learned in there. And, um, it's just phenomenal. And then kind of, you know, at some point then when I got onto Steiner and Goethe and the ethers, I'm going, this is the same stuff. It's exactly the same. It's just got different cultural and dogmatic masks on top, but it's the same archetype. So I, so basically I end this, I kind of show the reference, the, the relationship of the archetypes of the East and West as the formative processes of consciousness and how we interact with the world and get into what we call, because the gateway to the mandala is um, the Dhyani Buddha Akshobhya, the unmovable one. And he holds the Vajra, which is the gateway to the mandala. You got the external 
mandala an internal one and they have to reflect perfectly in order to move on right the, the mirror like wisdom it is a mirror right so you can't be taking foreign concepts you don't understand and putting them inside or you have disrupted consciousness you're not on the path so how do you become clear in this and this is why i like the gertian sciences i believe is the ideal platform for working with this because once you understand the prismatic experiments and the plant morphology and how all these dynamic aspects work into the living nature of the biosphere of which we are basically independent consciousness nodes connected you know within it our human ego separates us but you know we need the plant world for the for the oxygen we breathe they need the carbon dioxide right we we're symbiotic and the microbiome, we share our microbiome through with the um, biosphere. So we're thoroughly connected. So I wanna know how things really work out here. I don't care about like what people think about quantum stuff. Um, the quantum is like a distorted mirror of the higher forces. And I show this, I actually have a little reference chart where I show the aspects of you know the seed, uh, you know, the aspects of basically the metamorphoses of plants are really the stages of the quantum realm. You know, so we can see it in the higher sense or we can see it in the subsensible beneath matter side, whichever way you want it. So ultimately that, that that's it. I mean, the mandala is us. Like I say, the skandhas are just, to, you know, since we mentioned them, so it's form, that's us. That's the first part. Then there's sensation. That's, the second part, right? The, the gift giving jewel is a sensation. The third part is cognition or processing that, yeah, and the symbol of that is like the lotus, you know, sitting there in meditation doing it. And then the, the, the fourth one is um, volition or uh, all accomplishing karma free action, right? If you balance everything out and you've interacted properly through this, well, at the beginning, in the first part of this workshop, I introduced the uh, liberal arts, the trivium and quadrivium, the, the tri which I never really read any book on that. I've just kind of picked this up over the years, little pieces here and there, because it made so much sense. And um, I've written articles on it. Um, so the trivium, grammar, logic, rhetoric, grammar, not just being using proper grammar, but the ability of using proper grammar to properly describe objects and occurrences and experiences in objective space, as well as true ideations that arise in the mind, like the ideations we're talking about from man or matter, right? How do you actually describe something like this so people can read it and get this ideation and bring it in? You know, people think idea, well, I have an idea, you know, how to make a light bulb or something. Well, you know, that's a cool idea, but it's not necessarily a greater ideation in that sense. And of course, this is something we get into in the beginning as well. What is an idea? Like for Plato, an idea comes from the ideal realm, right? The, the, the ideas are perfect and our world's just a shadow of it, right? The whole Plato's cave thing. You know, was there Aristotle, right? There were, forget the ideal realm, right? He, he was the basis of modern scientific thought and a brilliant philosopher, but it was all about, we're born with a blank slate and we pull these ideas out of the inherent nature of things that are created, but we can never know the subsensible. And this is the same with Immanuel Kant and Goethe, Immanuel Kant, we can never know the subsensible, but it's okay, you know, for going through the discursive side, whereas the other ones, we wanna know the subsensible because this is our gateway to the higher realms. And like I say, eventually we pass through here but the interesting thing, because it's not just the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it's kind of the book of living and dying. There's six bardos, there's three of life, three of death. We're surrounded by this all the time. It's in the grounded state now. And when you die, you go into the ungrounded state. And if you don't recognize these patterns and energies, then how are you gonna do this? And that's why I see the um, spectrochrome system. There's an interesting thing, even though you had 12 colors, he made them with five slides and we'll discuss the color matching and the importance of this, of how this is actually this inner ideated structure of light and color. It's amazing stuff. And it's sort of like the rainbow heart of the Buddha, you know, in the, 
Tibetan Book of the Dead, they talk about where you're going through the different stages and meeting these different aspects and expressions of the different wisdoms. It says, well, if you didn't like catch on, you know, take refuge in the rainbow heart of the Buddha. So you think, well, you know, this is a transliteration of people that came back from there. So what actually is the old rainbow heart of the Buddha? Well, what's the, what's the heart chakra is the Anahata. And the Anahata chakra in the traditional system is a Vayu, the, um, the, uh, the, the air tattva. And that's actually six pointed star inside of it, which is a six pointed star. So in the ideal realm in the Sambhogakaya, right, the, the middle realm between the Nirmanakaya, this realm and the Dharmakaya, which is the Buddha realm, which is, so we're in that middle realm sort of passing through in the, um, in the Bardo, um, the archetypal heart is the six pointed star of the colors of Dinsha and Goethe, right? This is the archetypal nature. So if you know this, if you take refuge in it, take refuge while you're here, why not? And maybe you learn a few things along the way. So anyway, so that's, so there's basically the workshop's kind of three, a greater idea of the big archetype, but then it goes through the ideation of the formation of ideas as an archetype, whether you can connect to the ideal realm or not. Then we take that sort of way and we use the fact we can connect to the supersensible realm into Goethe's metamorphoses of plants leading into the cosmological botany. And then we get into light and color and through prismatic experiments and through visual stuff with, um, we call it the uh, complementary colors and get into things, the eye beam and people can photograph from the retina and different ideas like that. And then we get into the spectrochrome, um, things like pinhole cameras, you know, pinhole cameras actually refute both photons and rays of light. And I'll show experiments. Uh, my bioarchitect partner did experiments with his father, who was an Austrian artist, where they made bowls and they covered the inside of the bowl with photographic material. And then you put a sheet on it with a pinhole and the images showed 90 degrees. I mean, all, all the way around the bowl, they got, and there's no, there's no rays coming in at 90 degrees and there's certainly no photons doing it. So we cover all these ideas to show that there actually is at every point, the light ether and the light ether, of course, weaves the plant. So we're, these ideas are filtered through, but then that's the end. So the light and color basically leads us into the concept of the ethers and the ethers as part of our being and then part of our consciousness and our ability to connect inward and outward and how we can start seeing how these things operate within the material realm through the natural scientific concepts brought forth by Goethe. And while we don't deal with it so much in this workshop, because there's so much, there's a whole other series gets into what I call the living natural energies. And in that we get into like, you know, water structure, vortex energy, Wilhelm Reich's work with the orgone, uh, Trevor Constable's work with etheric rain engineering, kind of taking uh, Reich's work and bringing it forward through like, you know, geometric orgone accumulators and showing like the orgone is like the uh, tone ether, which basically ties in with water and all of that. And in that, then we show that the practical aspect of that is functional things like water structure units that we're developing and bioarchitecture where you're building buildings that actually harmonize earth and sky, you know, can actually, you know, bring natural weather patterns back and enhance the life of people. And so there's a practical aspect to all of this, that the whole purpose, it's not just philosophical. It, you know, that's why I call myself a natural philosopher because people say you're a scientist. I go, not really. That's kind of got a bad name. <laughs> and I don't even know what to call anything spiritual science, you know, because spiritual people have funny ideas about that. They have funny ideas about science. So I try to call it the cognitive sciences, or I don't even have a name for it. Wizard. You're um, a wizard, darling. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that, but I try to be. Um, <laughs> so like Schopenhauer, right? He said, genius is an eminently clear consciousness of things in general. So I strive towards that as, as well as Confucius said, true knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. 
It's so funny that you would mention those two chances, like obsessed with both of them right now, Schopenhauer and Confucius. And I have to, like, I'm more, I know more about Confucius than I do about Schopenhauer at this point, except his general interest in idealism or idealism. But Confucius had some really smart ideas, uh, like the job of the government is to keep the people happy. Like what happened to that one? I don't know where that one went. (laughs) there's a more there's a moral order to the confucian confucius's work yeah for sure and it's interesting because i Um, didn't realize that the the Taoists came in and kind of deconstructed it because i was i would consider myself more Taoist than confucianism but when i and so i was all like yay confucius and so i have to work those out in my head how do they work together and fit together but this is why this workshop is so good because darling if i had to read these books i don't know if I could penetrate them honestly I don't think I could penetrate them let alone digest them so I think I'm really happy that you're doing the the hard yards for me personally you know I mean it sounds like it's a yeah, lot yeah, no. to wrap your head around it is I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around it but I've at least reached a point where I can explain it a bit and share and um and, honestly, and that's why through slides I mean I've got yeah. I was just gonna say honestly. Say about 170. <laughs> you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I have there's about 170 slides. There's a lot of material to go through. Some faster than others. Some have words. Some don't. But you know, and a lot of it because this will you know the workshop will be recorded and people can go back through and and look at the things and get it again. But I'm just trying to create the record of the knowledge, right? This is, I would say, this is like postgraduate metaphysics. Um, you know, not that I've re- attained that level, but I, I got enough that I can pretend I do. So um, <laughs> I, I don't think like, there is such a degree. So I'm happy to agree with you have it, darling, because in our materialist society, I don't think there is such a thing. So with all of your work, you've earned it. But what I was going to say also, the aspect of teaching it to and explaining it to people is one of the most profound ways to really absorb it at yourself. You know what I mean? It's a really, really good process. So hmm. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Out of all of these books, if you had to say just one, which would be the one? And I didn't know you've written books yourself, darling. Um, I've put books together. I suppose I've written well. I've- what I do? No, I mean, I've compiled books. I was doing, I've more compiling and editing. The only thing I really wrote was the book I did with Trevor Constable called Loom of the Future. Wow. Uh, which was a history of his weather engineering, which we did an interview because he was on the road. So I'd like send him questions. Yeah, he was on the ship, right? Ship, ship's officer. So whenever he'd get to land and get my faxes and stuff, because that was all pre-internet days. And he'd answer my questions and went back and forth and I should well. So I've been writing a number of articles now on my alchemics dot art, um, and they're amazing. Too. Anybody and, who's interested, I yeah, highly recommend go go and read those. They're just so yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are going to be turned into a book. That, that's I decided to actually write a book, but that's a way to do it and do it in chapters like that. And I want to say too that doing these workshops for me, these are my learning experiences because I'm, you know, this stuff I've read over decades. But to pull it all together and explain it, I'm having to go back through the references and double check them. And and I'm going, oh, yeah, I'm getting new epiphanies. I'm going, wait a minute. I forgot because one of the things I'm throwing at the end, I didn't even think of it, is Rudolf Hauschka's vitamin experiments, where he did right at the beginning of vitamins. I didn't know this, but the way the vitamins got their names is they had these diseases. It it came around during like when uh, like Roller like synthesized urea and they realized that not everything was. They thought, well, everything's chemical, right? Started coming this materialistic consciousness. But they were doing experiments with like synthetic milk and regular milk and feeding cows and stuff. And they found that this cows weren't like responding properly. They were getting ill from the synthetic. So they thought there was something like vitality. And they had defined these like four types of general diseases things, A, B, C, and D. And they were trying to find substances that actually did those. And this is the origins of the vitamins. But what Hauschka did is he actually, using different substances, he filtered out different parts of the spectrum, like infrared, visible, and UV, and showed that these basically, by blocking these out, these caused the avitaminosis diseases. 
and that way you could, where you could bring bring them back in. And fundamentally, what he showed is is that the ethers are in sunlight, right? And they're part of the vitality. But we know, you know, D for sure, which you know is actually a hormone could, that we have to get out of the sunlight. But he couldn't filter that out of this spectrum. He got that. You know, he, to get the full thing, he had to create a vacuum, right? Because not all of it was on the spectrum, the formative forces. So anyway, we'll go through this with charts and the yeast experiments. I mean, there's it's a lot to take in. I was just trying to give a general idea. I think that's amazing, uh, Dolly. This well, is the sort of stuff I think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you're a big brain. Well, I can't wait for the workshop. And what I'm going to do for the people at home is I'm going to write down all of these books and I'm going to put them in the notes so that you can go out and buy them for yourselves. But my advice is come to the workshop <laughs> and, let, and let Tom do all the hard work Please for do. us. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me your favorite books in this category. We're going to have to do six more on other categories because I want to learn more about the energies and the Reich stuff. So we'll have to do that, darling. And I just, I'm always, there's always, every time I talk to Thomas, I learn something new. So, you know, we'll just continue this until I've got all of the, Juicy stuff out of your brain, Dolly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you know you uh, encouraging me along. You've been just a wonderful friend these past couple of years, and it's really gotten me to really focus and put the materials together. You're rather than trying to focus on making money again and doing things like that. It's like no, I'm just like focused on this knowledge and just trusting the universe to move it all forward. Sweetie, it's, it is of the utmost importance, right? And it is a true gift to humanity, what you were doing. And I'm blessed to know you with all, just with all seriousness. And it just, it just sucks, right? As we've discussed many times, it just sucks that this digital serfdom and materialism in the financial sense seems to be the main driver when people like yourself have pearls of wisdom, pearls of delicious, juicy mind ideas that are actually truth of the universe. And, you know, what's her name that goes, chicka, 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 boom, 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 is making $55 million a year. <laughs> You know, it's insane, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. no, I saw something as a thing on Instagram. This guy's going around interviewing. Well, how, how much money do you have in the bank? Well, five million dollars. Uh, how do you make that? I go. I show pictures of my feet on OnlyFans. Here we go, darling. Go, if, Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, I you know because I know. I mean, I've I've known and met many brilliant people through my life, and they're the ones that struggle the hardest. That's why I came to call it the thorny path of truth. Yes. It's like, um, it's almost like you, your soul is like trying to grasp this greater idea and understand it and get what I call spiritual proprioc proprioceptivity to be grounded in, in the higher realms. But it kind of like, it drags you through all these like social and business and all this other stuff you got to deal with. You go, where the hell do these people come from, man? They're like, and of course, legal stuff. And you think, man, these people are like, their souls are dead, right? And this is one of my other theories. I think a lot of people that run the system, especially sort of in the um, administrative realm, they have some sort of thing like toxoplasmosis, which is actually, I believe that these parasites are anchors for dark spiritual forces. Because one of the interesting things, and I've brought this out in this other talk I gave many years ago on the guy in superorganism where I was talking about this and the microbiome and the, how the parasites are kind of part of it, but causing these problems. But you start looking at, they were doing these research on people with um, toxoplasmosis and seeing it. And what they found out is they have the general tendency, the ones that go to university take business. And if they're into any fetishes or anything, they're into bondage and discipline. I'm thinking that sounds like our politicians, darling. <laughs> oh. Exactly. Exactly. The, the signatures of the dark forces are there for sure. You know, it's so, so interesting. I just did um, this podcast where I was talking about the spiritual and the material realm. And I was addressing Steiner's doppelganger, the um, immaterial unconscious entity that 
resides in our body, as he says, because our souls don't take up all the meat content. So it's really interesting to consider the idea that the way that they're able to access is through the toxic plasmosis, right? And then Ingo mm -hmm. talks about non-human entities that are working with the government that are that are having these big funding amounts of money going into these areas to try to control mankind. So my point was that if you do not open yourself to these realms, how are we ever going to fix these crazy situations in the first place, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, it's like a, you know, it's a mission, right? Yeah. A responsibility, right? You have to, you have to do it. No, I can't not do this work. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's a, comp it's, it's a compulsion. Generally thankful, thankless not from people like yourselves, I mean, um, but from society at large, they don't care. They look at you like that funny, you know, the fluoride stare, they call it. Well, that movie <laughs> Don't Look Up was just such a brilliant treatise on the state of things today is that you could literally have the most important information in the world, that there is a comet coming at you and I'm gonna blow up the whole planet and people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. What's my Twitter account? How many likes have I got? You know what I mean? Like that movie, have you seen it? Don't look up if you haven't. Yes. Okay. It's like, you know, my popula popularity ratings are gonna, well, you're not gonna have any life to have a popularity, popularity rating anyway, if you don't look up. And it's kind of like that kind of situation, right? It's just, it's um it boggles the mind darling but your stuff titillates the mind and so i'm so blessed to know you and i appreciate this and i appreciate you taking the time and look to be completely frank i would say i don't know a good probably 20 percent of my books in my library have been recommended by this man and he's only really talked about one that i have right now but there's so many more We've got the star mirror, darling, for example. So we'll do another talk another day and uh, get through some more of the books that you've turned me on to. Oh, The Indoctrinated Brain, for one thing. That one is a must. That is a now book. So get that now. We'll put that up because you turned me on to that one as well. So we'll say just get it and read it. We won't even get into it now. Just get it and read it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I think those are two of the most important books to read today, besides Man or Matter and all that, what we discussed here. But outside of that, The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg and The Indoctrinated Brain by Dr. Michael Nels. And between those two books, that will really give you a real understanding of what the situation is on the planet today. The horror of the situation. The horror of the situation. Well, how do you get out of that? That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Looking up, looking up at the super sensible realm. Yeah, how, how do you do that? Yeah, the super sensible is archetypal, as we understand through, you know, Plato and all of and Goethe. You know, they have different ways of looking at it, but that's basically what what it is. So yeah, this is a looking look up, looking up workshop. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time, darling. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I'll put the link to your class as well in the comments so that people can find out more about that. And I believe that if they subscribe to your Substack, they get a free ticket as well. That's another option. So that's what it is. Yeah, they take a year subscription, which is $80 um, just to support. And yeah, just yearly paid subscribers. I'm just going to be letting on free for the workshops. Fantastic. Because they're the ones that are supporting me. Oh, yeah. right. My loves. Well, I say get onto it and uh, I will see you in there and I will see you in there, Thomas. So thank you so much for your time, <laughs> darling. All right. Thank you, Venice. You have a wonderful day.